Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Alex Ago, the Director of Programming at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. And I'm very excited uh, to be joining with Blumhouse Television and Hulu for a special screening of the new installment of Blumhouse Television's Into the Dark. We're going to run the whole film for you tonight, and then we have a great panel discussion to follow uh, with the director and uh, executive producer, Clara Aronovich, who's also an alumna of the School of Cinematic Arts, uh, plus writer Alexandra Peckman, um, and the uh, story writer and executive producer, Nick Antosca, uh, executive producer, Alex Keen, um, and cast members, uh, Dana Drury and Casey Diedrich. Uh, so it's it's going to be a great night, and uh, I'd like to now welcome up um, the president of Blumhouse Television, Chris McCumber, who will get things started. All right, thank you. Thank you, Alex. And uh, hi, everybody. I'm Chris McCumber, president of Blumhouse Television, and I'd like to welcome you this evening to a screening of Tentacles. Uh, this is always a special event for us, but tonight it, it really does feel even more so. Uh, that's because this incredible team of filmmakers, cast and crew, whether the pandemic shut down under COVID safety guidelines to bring the Valentine's Day installment of our anthology series into the dark to you tonight, and of course, to the audience on Hulu. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank them for their dedication, their hard work. Um, I also want to thank our partners, of course, at Hulu and the Blumhouse team who helped shepherd this project along. Tentacles is directed by Clara Aronov Aronovich and is written by Alexandra Peckman from a story by Alexandra and Nick Antoska. Uh, both Alexandra and Nick actually worked with me at Sci-Fi on, uh, on Channel Zero, so it's really good to be in business with them again. Um, and all of you, just, just great work. You should be very, very proud. So I'd now like to turn the virtual mic over to my partner in crime, Jeremy Gold, who has been spearheading the series alongside our studio's steadfast team. Jeremy, take it away. Thank you, uh, Chris, for the, for the mic handoff, the virtual mic handoff. Um, it's uh, great to, uh, to see you all. Wish we all could be in person raising a glass, but this will, uh, this will certainly uh, suffice for a night. And look, it's incredibly exciting to be back with you all after 23 months of continuous production on Into the Dark. It was definitely surreal, as Chris mentioned, when we had to had to find a new way to work, but but we all, you guys all did it, and we're so incredibly grateful uh, to be here tonight and to share this remarkable film with you. Um, uh, I'm, we have lots of people to thank, and then we'll get to the fun part when I hand you over to your amazing filmmakers tonight. Um, but first, uh, uh, big acknowledgement to our incredible cast. Um, you guys were fearless. Uh, Dana Drury, Casey Diedrich, Casey Elise Baker, um, Evan Williams, Kathy Vu, Daniel Aid, Brianna Kennedy Coker, David L. King, Harry Katzman, Johnny Ramey, Larry Fields III, and uh, Vito D'Ambrosio. Thank you all so much for your hard work. Our incredible uh, crew uh, who keeps delivering uh, now 23 movies and running and about to be 24. Uh, Alex Kern, our executive producer, Lauren Downey, executive producer, Scott Ford, our terrific line producer, Melissa Costin Bowder, our incredible casting director, Sing Hao Yam, our terrific director of DP, Eve, uh, Eve McCartney, who's done so many of these as production designer for us, does such a great job. Lynette Meyer, the same, our amazing costume designer. Andrew Westman, back for more fun editing. Uh, Lindsay Wolfington, our music supervisor, our terrific composers tonight. Uh, Ari Belusian and Ryan Hope, thank you both. Laura Leffring, our makeup department head. Uh, Selena Yebra, our hair department head. And Heidi Strykowitz, our wonderful set decorator. Also huge thank you to all of our partners at Hulu, Craig Erwick, Dandy Nicola, Mitchell Squires, Jason Bronta, and everybody at Hulu for all your support throughout two seasons of Into the Dark. Thank you all so much. Um, and uh, we would not be here tonight without all of our amazing team at Blumhouse, Jordana Garino, Olga Hamlet, Tevin Edelman, Lisa Needenthal, Ann Peterson, Mark Barson, Shea Pittman, Jenny Shiara, and our terrific marketing team. And last but not least, a big special thanks to you, Alex Algo, and everyone at USC Film School. USC and Blumhouse have a really unique relationship and we're very grateful for it. And Clara happens to be uh, uh, an alum. Um, so thank you so much, USC, for inviting us to screen our film. 
Uh, and we appreciate the warm reception we always get from you, USC and the students and alumni alike. Please tell your friends and family that Tentacles premieres this Friday, February 12th on the Hulu. And finally, it gives me great pleasure to introduce your filmmakers tonight of Tentacles, director Clara Aronovich and writer and my fellow Northwestern Wildcat alum, Alexandra Peckman. So I will hand it over to you two ladies. Hi, oh my gosh, Jeremy, thank you so much. Um, USC, holy crap, guys. It's my first feature and I get to premiere it with you guys before we even release it to the whole world. I can't even tell you how deeply moved I am and how honored I am to be in association with Blumhouse on this project. And yeah, tossing it over to you, Allie. I just wanna say, obviously this is a love story. It's Valentine's Day and COVID could not even stop this, uh, this love. Um, and it feel, I'm just incredibly grateful to Blumhouse and Hulu. It's not every day that you can say uh, people stuck by this stuck by this story, even in the face of a global crisis, uh, especially as a writer, and uh, especially uh, Jordana Grino, who brought the script into the Into the Dark Family, which I'm so excited to be part of. Uh, there's like way too many people to think an incredible cast and everybody who worked so hard and in the face of unprecedented challenge and our intrepid, fearless director, Clara, who has created this twisted, dark, atmospheric, atmospheric, beautiful world that I really can't wait for people to see. So um, I just want to remind everyone out there, if you're watching, that we've got a Q&A box where you can type in questions. And when we open this up for uh, the live Q&A session with the audience, uh, I'll call on people. We love to have people turn their videos on. And so what we'll do is put a little running order of who we're going to call on. We'll welcome you over as panelists. You can turn on your video and chat with everyone. Uh, it should be a, a lot of fun. Uh, but in the meantime, I really hope that you enjoy Tentacles, and I look forward to speaking with you in about 85 minutes. Okay, welcome back, everyone. I really hope that you guys enjoyed Tentacles. And I'm very excited to get to talk to the cast and crew. Uh, so I'd just like to welcome everyone up. We've got the director and executive producer and SCA alumna, Clara Aronovich. Um, we've got the writer, Alexandra Peckman, um, the story writer and executive producer, Nick Antosca, executive producer, Alex Keen. Uh, and we have our two leads uh, playing Tara. We have uh, Dana Drury and playing Sam, we have Casey Diedrich. Thank you guys so much for, for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, you um, let's, let's talk about this story because it explores some really universal themes. And what I love about horror is that it's an opportunity through genre to really make literal, to sort of manifest some of these themes into a, uh, into a, a monstrous figure. Um, so I guess the, the real question is, did the story always start off as being um, uh, a, horror, uh, a horror story or was it a love story or drama exploring themes that then evolved as, as it sort of uh, came together? I think it's both. I mean, uh, I hope I haven't said this already. It started as a nightmare that I had uh, and turned to the person that I was in the early throes of a relationship with, uh, who's, who's Nick. And uh, he told me when I told him about this dream, it sounded like a cool horror movie. Um, so, that was sort of the beginning. So both both love and horror entwined. Uh, and uh, we collaborated on this story together and then I wrote the script. Um, Nick, how do you process taking uh, uh, inspiration from a dream and turning that into an actual scripted story? 
I mean, uh, dreams are free money, right? For, for <laughs> our writers. It's just, uh, you know, you wake up, uh, your heart's pounding and you're freaked out and you're like, awesome. Oh, where's, where's my notebook? Um, you know, I, I, Ali obviously, uh, has some pretty vivid, intense dreams. So it's, you know, it's, it's like rich territory. Um, it's, it's very nice to see the, the, the central character uh, actually be a woman who's, you know, for inhabiting this sort of monstrous component. Um, tell us about deciding to write the character as female. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm excited to get to talk about it. No, no spoiler alerts required since everyone's seen it. Uh, I love the book, Men, Women, and Chainsaws, just a classic, iconic horror theory book about, uh, which coins the term final girl and just talks about gender and horror. And uh, I thought it would be really cool to write something where the final girl ends up being the monster or the person that we think is gonna be our final girl ends up being the monster. And we actually sort of have a, a final boy rather. Uh, and also that, you know, I think in a lot of movies like this, uh, where the woman is the villain or the monster, it's because she's crazy or she wants money or she's a liar. And I think that in our case, it's because this woman is just really powerful and scary, uh, which was really fun to play with and write and watch everybody really run with. Um, so uh, I want to know how this wound up becoming a part of Into the Dark. Um, I, you know, there obviously every month there is a theme uh, connected to something special about that month and uh, tentacles is their uh, Valentine's Day offering. So um, let's talk a little bit about having written the script, um, taking it to Blumhouse and then how Clara got involved because this is your debut feature. Well, we had a prior, I, Jordana Greeno, who uh, worked on Channel Zero with Nick, with me, uh, read the script and saw it as something that would make for a perfect addition to the Into the Dark family. Um, and Nick can speak more to the kind of producing side. No, we, we had been watching uh, Into the Dark. We've been watching the show and, you know, we had seen uh, like Gigi Saul Guerrero's episode. There were a bunch that we were really into. Um, and so when Jordana reached out, we were super excited to, to, uh, to see it become an Into the Dark. Um, and then Clara came in with like this great take on it. She showed us a lot of paintings, like a lot of uh, a really cool, art book and uh, we just, we, we really wanted to see Clara's tentacles. So t tell us about how you, how you came to the project in terms of like getting, uh, you know, get, getting the gig to, to actually go ahead with your debut. Sure, um, I had actually had a general meeting. This is one of those, those rare instances and because I'm speaking to the FCA community it's really cool to be able to speak really candidly about how the job came came to me and so often we go on these general meetings right where and you don't know if anything will ever come from it but it's just like oh maybe someday down the line there will be a script or you know blah blah, blah. it's like kind of a blind date to a certain extent and that that general meeting was actually with Nick's partner at his production company Eat the Cat Alex Headland, and it was a good vibe and we're like cool if there's something down the line that feels right we'll holler at each other. But he also kind of knew that tentacles was in the background or something that they were about to come upon. And he sent it my way. And he's like, you know, if it, if it, if it does it for you, like, let me know. And my team and I read it and we thought, what a great opportunity, what a really cool project and how amazing that it's set up at Blumhouse. Yeah, I would love to offer my take. And then I met with Allie to see if we had a good vibe and she scared the shit out of me because of how smart she is and how thoughtful she is, which I love, love so much. The woman speaks fucking Mandarin and Portuguese, y'all. Like, I was like, who is this person? Um, yeah, I'm going to embarrass her. But, um, but I loved it. And it was, and she was so, she's so, you can tell on the page, but so intentional, so considered in everything that she does. And I was very excited to then offer my take, which, yeah, I, as Nick mentioned, I put together my treatment, which was almost 60 pages long. 
incredibly <laughs> um, thorough and extensive and beautiful. <laughs> very thorough. Thank you. Well, I mean, having come from the music video and commercial world, wherein I, my jobs are always contingent upon how strong my deck is. And then of course my pitch, if I get to progress, I knew the deck had to be strong and I knew there would be a lot of questions, even though I had just come off of an episode of network TV, because it's the debut feature, people are always wondering, can you even do this job? So I wanted to beat a lot of a lot of the questions to the punch and just offer off the cuff, like, this is how I would tackle intimacy. This is how I would shoot it. This is how I would lens it. This is the color palette. These are the paintings to which I want to refer. These are the films. Here are links to the films that are my references. This is how I see the creatures being done because before we were going to do it all practically. Um, so it was extremely thorough. And I think that thoroughness and care really paid off. And I was able to pitch to Blumhouse and they sent me up to Hulu and then here we are. Mm. For, for all the producers here, uh, was there, were there certain specific things that really stood out in all of that process uh, that Clara just outlined that made you know that this was the right choice? Okay. No. Get a, for, a all producers thing. are muted. <laughs> right. Uh, Alex, go for it, Nick. Because I, I, you guys really did the, the full vetting and, and found Clara. So by the time I started interacting with her, a lot of decisions were already coming together and she had really made it through to the final round uh, of, of options. So you guys really were the ones who spearheaded that. Yeah, it was, it was um, you know, Clara came in with such passion and curiosity and focus on the relationship being the core of the horror. And, you know, we always look for, um, uh, and by we, I mean, you know, horror writers, I, uh, and producers, uh, what's the emotional core of the horror story? And and Clara approached it from that direction. And you know, when when Denna and Casey came in, and when every the whole team was together, everybody sort of approached it from that direction. That was really cool. Uh, well, uh, I'm certainly excited to talk about uh, what it was like to play this role of like. Uh -huh. Victim and victimizer, Dana, can you talk about what drew you to this part? Uh, definitely. I, um, wow, so many ways to answer that question. Uh, when I got the audition as a self tape in my email, um, before I even opened the PDF, I saw Ali's name in the email. And I was immediately intrigued. Um, I've been a fan of Ali as a writer for a long time. Uh, before she decided to take a career switch into writing movies. And um, she's a very, very talented writer. And so I was immediately intrigued. And I, as I read the script, I knew that it was going to be a challenge, that it was a lot to take on. There was even like a, a like a warning or like a, a, like an asterisk in the, in the audition breakdown that was like, actor must have extreme range and like a wide breath. And I was like, great, um, what a challenge. And the audition process was very similar. It was, it was quite extensive. There were many scenes to show a wide arc and I just went from one extreme to the other. Um, and in the callback, uh, Clara had given me incredible notes to work with, which made it really easy to sort of pick up and run with. Um, and so that was the audition process for me. And then on the, like when we were on set, um, just being able to work with Casey and work off of Casey made my job so much easier. And uh, working with Clara, who is very good at um, understanding how her actors work uniquely. Um, so when she gives notes, she gives notes specific to what she sees the actor is capable of or not capable of. So really um, that specificity was so helpful for um, being able to fine tune. I think I can't speak for Casey, but for like for my performance, it was, it, was, it felt very um, bespoke. It's an awful word to use, <laughs> but it felt very like catered to what I, she understood my, but we, we shared a, a vocabulary right away. And so, um, yeah, I had a great support system and I just, I had complete permission to be a freak and to do weird shit. And if it didn't work and trust me, a lot of it didn't work. And I got laughed at in the face many times by Clara. 
Um, but you know, they let me do it and then they just threw it away and Clara would send me embarrassing takes on my phone afterwards that have been, <laughs> that have been deleted. Don't that worry. That happened one time. <laughs> it was great. It was great. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it was, I, I did a lot of work on Tara prior to coming to set. I, I had a, a lot of conscious work about how she moved and what her storyline was. And then on the day, it was just sort of like, fucking go for it and try as many things as possible. Take, like, add as much color as you can. Commit super hard to the circumstances. And hopefully, hopefully they like it. <laughs> um, I want to I wanna quickly come back uh, uh, to something after uh, a couple more questions, just to give you time to think about this. But I would love to know some of the adjustments that, or, or some of the notes that you got, just since you know we have young filmmakers watching and it's always really fascinating to hear how directors work with actors. Um, so just to give you a second to, to, to jog, jog your memory, so I'm not putting you too much on the spot. Um, but Casey, tell us what, what, was the, what was the description of your character uh, that sort of drew you to the, to the part? You gotta unmute. That always happens at least once on Zoom, always. Um, I think ultimately what, uh, what happened in the beginning was I actually auditioned for Grant. Um, and I, as I read through the script more, I was like, I'm, I'm not a Grant, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Sam. And I looked down the list of who was directing it and I saw that it was Clara, who I had previously, I had previously just worked with a couple of months prior to that on In the Dark, which is the show I'm on now. And so, uh, you know, I contacted her and just said, hey, I'm auditioning for this. I put myself on tape. Uh, she's like, don't bother. We, you know, we're, we're, we already have someone in mind. And uh, I ended up sending it anyway. And um, I ended up getting the role, which is uh, a, bl a blessing because I, this is one of my favorite roles I've ever done in my, in my career. And, you know, I think reading this script, uh, you know, it, Alexandra is such an incredible writer and it, it, it was the character just spoke to me so much whereas I, I wasn't thinking of, of him as just a love interest in, in, a, in a, uh, a horror romance film. I, I saw so much texture and substance to this character. I was reading between the lines and uh, the more I read about him, I, it broke my heart. It just, I, I just related to him, his insecurities, his loneliness, his, uh, you know, running away from his problems by drinking alcohol. And um, I think that, you know, I, I'm i more um, attracted to his darkness than, than his, his ability to be a hero, you know? And so I think that's what I focused on. And, um, you know, Clara is a very uh, process-oriented director. I think um, she's, I don't know, when I first worked with her on In the Dark, you know, she messaged me and she's like hey let's let's just go grab a drink let's talk about the character let's talk about the scenes and I was like what what are you what what are you talking about and like I've never heard that from a director before no like no directors ever reached out to me and said hey let's talk about your character let's talk about the scene and that set the bar so high for me like I was like I'm I'm done I'm pretty good like working with anybody else but Clara <laughs> so uh um uh yeah I think and that just carried over into this into this film and you know, she did. She had links to every film that inspired her for this movie. Uh, um, uh, portraits, photos, uh, references, color schemes. And she just made it so, like, easy to, to work with her um, that, like, I'll, I'll never forget this experience. And, like, no pun intended, but I'll walk with her into the dark any day. Like, I'll, I'll do it because she's awesome. So, yeah. Wow. Laura, what were some of those uh, influences? Oh, guys, I'm so moved by all this feedback. And Alex, you know that's like a director's favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> I, let's see. I mean, well, I, I'm sorry. I just have to say, like, may, I have to respond to the love fest because Dana and Casey, like, without the confidence of your actors, again, because I know I'm speaking to a bunch of directors in the audience, like, if you don't have the confidence of your actors and if you haven't built a safe container, you may as well just walk home knowing that you're going to make something mediocre. And especially in genre, especially when you're pushing people and asking themselves, 
in front of camera who at the end of the day are carrying greater risk than anything I could carry because they wear the film. If there's not like a safe place to access fear, access shame, access vulnerability and access both like a wounded masculine and wounded feminine, you know, then, then why do the job, you know? So their trust was integral um, to the success of their performances, which I think are really, really stellar. Now to talk about references. <laughs> I mean, I love, I love a slow burn. I think you can tell, hopefully you can tell, like I'm, I'm so moved by kind of more contemplative, contemplative, like kind of laconic, slow boil types of films, the likes of which you'll see kind of Tarkovsky make or Kishlovsky. I love Eastern European cinemas. I love a lot of, a lot of Asian horror is really moving to me. Like a lot of South Korean horror really impacts me. But also just like, you know, classics from Polanski, like classics from Hitchcock. I like, I love people who can within the bounds of what would be considered a commercial film or a commercially viable film, which I would say all of Hitchcock is, still push and still ask questions that we're not used to being asked as an audience. And, you know, people who can bring like masterful tone, no matter what genre, like Kubrick, or I mean, Denis Villeneuve, I think is like a master of tone. And tone is at the end of the day, I think the primary job of the director, right? Like there's of course story, there's of course like consistency, but at the end of the day, it's tone that we are in charge of, that we have to be the stewards of and make sure that, that we can kind of bring our audience in and tell them, this is how I'm going to treat you. This is how I'm going to speak to you. And this is how I wanna interact with you. Um, so, Dana, were you able to think of? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it, I, I should say that it varies from actor to actor. So even though I give a few specific examples um, for other filmmakers out there, like I think you really have to pay attention to how your actor works. In my case, um, it was very clear to me as we were shooting, what my what I was what was in my wheelhouse and what I was comfortable with and what I wasn't comfortable with, and I would say that I was very comfortable with the intimacy scenes and less comfortable with the um, like deep vulnerability like fear scenes. That's a harder, it's a bigger reach for me, and I think that Clara did a really good job of of seeing what my tells were. One of which is and I'm doing it right now, uh, not taking full deep breaths when I get nervous and um, she would have me, you know, take a second and, and put my voice back in my body and find a deeper register. And that would immediately sort of ground me and bring me right back. And I think Casey and I have very different ways of working, which were very complimentary, but to be able to um, understand like two pretty opposing approaches to, um, to our respective characters and and give notes on that accordingly is just, I mean, the dream that you want in a director. You know, you mentioned earlier that you had, you came in really sort of uh, uh, having created the world of this character before we see them in real time. But um, I was wondering if that was for Lena or for the alien octopus <laughs> A great question. It was a, a four-parter. I did <laughs> Lena, Tara at the beginning, Tara in transformation, and Tara at the end. And although they all kind of blended together, uh, you know, they, they all have very different physical um, physical manifestations. As you see, Lena like half like pretty much broken at the beginning and terrified, and and then you get this very fearful, very uh, nervous Tara um, as she's sort of getting her feet, her, her tentacle, getting, uh, getting immersed in this new, in this new world. And as, um, as she get, gains strength and develops her relationship with Sam, she kind of gets deeper and more grounded and more slinky. Um, so I, I had worked on that a lot prior to, to shooting. I'm curious, Casey, if you, uh adopted any of the the physical sort of body language behavior that Dana had to establish earlier in the film when it was your turn to be the host? Uh, I, I think it was actually kind of the opposite because I, I think 
uh, Dana was trying to figure out how to walk like me. And like, I remember she called me in, in uh, one day and she's like, Hey, can you just like, just walk around the room for a couple minutes? And I was just like, yeah, sure. I'll do it. And like, you know, she would like really like physicalize how I walk and, and Sam, you know, Sam just walks with kind of a, a, a chip on his shoulder and he, he's just like, he's walking around with this cloud, this gray cloud over him at all times. And I think it just, it just kind of mimicked the way, like he was just kind of sluggish. He would kind of kick his, the back of his heels a little bit. And, um, and she was trying to figure out how I, you know, I, I voice a certain uh, uh, line in, in the, in the film, um, which is uh, the, the anxious line. Um, you know, I think it was more of her doing it with me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, uh, yeah, well, there was definitely a, a trade-off between the two. And the more I worked with her, the more like I studied her and, um, I think it just kind of came apart, you know, or came together uh, in the end there. So, um, yeah, it's very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, I want to ask just a couple of um, uh, production questions, but wanted to remind everyone out there in the audience, because uh, I'll open it up in a moment, uh, to just type some questions in the Q&A box, and then we'll, uh, we'll call on you. If you don't want to be brought on live, you can actually put that, just type in, for me to read it, but we'd love to see your faces. So I encourage you to do that. Um, so this film is really like a triumph within the pandemic because you had started production, right? Back in March. Um, so walk us through everything that happened in between, you know, from when you had to shut down to when you got started back up and what was it like to shoot? Alex, do you wanna take that one? Uh, yeah, sorry, I was uh, slightly distracted, of course, for the one moment right before a question comes to me. Uh, <laughs> quick refresher on the question, and then I can talk and talk. We're just basically uh, chatting about how the pandemic interrupted production and, you know, what you guys needed to do to be able to accomplish finishing the production and, you know, I mean, how, like, what were the parameters? How, how much time elapsed? Yeah. What, what had to change? Definitely. Well, it was, you know, I, we were uh, about a week into production when everything shut down. And, and then, of course, like it was with everyone, it was just kind of chaos for a while trying to figure out what we were going to do. We kind of walked away from set thinking, well, we'll be gone for a couple of weeks and then we'll pick up where we left off. Obviously, it didn't quite work out that way. And so we were exploring every every option. We were looking into animation on and off multiple times, which is a whole crazy uh, process of trying to figure that out and how we can integrate and make it work and would it or wouldn't it. And so went down a lot of different roads uh, in that regard. And then also looking at this is a movie that is in a lot of ways an erotic thriller and intimacy is then very difficult to do safely in this situation. And so figuring out ways we can rewrite things without losing anything, trying to figure out how we can shoot things without um, putting the actors in any more potential risk than necessary. And so there was a big process of, of just rejiggering our mindsets and how to do it. And ultimately we're able to come back into production um, and with a lot of safety measures in place, which meant we had to be really, really precise in how we shot everything. We didn't have extra wiggle room uh, for really anything, there are shorter days, one fewer camera than we normally shoot with, um, communications more difficult with everyone wearing masks and being separated. Um, but the team really came together and figured out ways to do it. And I'm really proud of the production team who we got a lot of compliments from all the guilds, all the unions, all the people who came to check in on us at how well everything was going, how uh, safe we were being. And then Clara and, and the rest of the team creatively just, you know, rolling with every punch in a lot of days on the fly we were like Clara and myself and the assistant director and the DP would be like okay we have three scenes left to shoot we can only do one how do we do this what can we cut what, we can, what can we change can we move this little piece to some other day so it was a uh, this constant kind of sprint in a weird like pinball machine bouncing all over the place trying to just make sure we're getting what we needed um and having each other's back so it was, it was really difficult it really changed the vibe on set especially at first after six months of not seeing people we'd work with for a long time you can't hug each other you can't do anything so everyone's separated and it's kind of weird and what's okay and what are people comfortable with but that kind of you know once we all eased into it after the first week and 
figured out those things, people were really respectful. And, and so it worked out. I wouldn't recommend it if it could be avoided. It definitely puts in a lot of challenges, but I think everyone rose to the challenge as you can see on screen. You know, I was just thinking that this film is representing Valentine's Day. <clears throat> was that always the, I mean, it's, it's a perfect match, but was that always the idea in terms of its timing for the release? It wasn't. We it, Something that's happened on, on a number of Into the Dark episodes, sometimes they come in and they're very obviously, this is good for this holiday or this holiday. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes we just like a script or a story and try and figure out how it could work. And the reality is that we were going to shoehorn this into August, into, I can't remember even what the holiday was, but it was not exactly one of the known major holidays. There's kind of a, a bunch of weird little holidays that happen all the time. So it kind of worked out that when we pushed, we realized that it works so well for Valentine's Day and then just started planning around that. We considered, didn't we consider National Renters Day or something like that? <laughs> that, was, that, that was one. There was also like a... a Girlfriend Appreciation Day or something. There are a bunch of things kind of like closer, that. Please. Yeah, yeah. It, it had to be Valentine's Day. It, it not, worked. Not even Valentine's Day. Quarantine Valentine's Day. It feels particularly appropriate. Yes, indeed. So, um, okay, I have uh, a few questions uh, from the audience, and I'm going to start by inviting over Gabe. Oh. Although Gabe, you're logged in twice, so I hope I'm transferring over the right one. I'll, I'll just bring both of you over and uh, whichever one is right, just turn on your video. Yes, it's my brother, guys. <laughs> <laughs> just make sure to unmute. Bro. It's my, I'm very proud of my sister. Brilliant we're work. proud of her too. We're proud of her too, Gabe. <laughs> oh, thank you guys. I'm very proud of my sister. She's brilliant. My question is not about my brilliant sister. Uh, my question was for the actors. Um, I was super impressed because, you know, I'm a psychiatrist. So like understanding people is, is my, my job. And so seeing how you could kind of bridge between like, kind of banal, kind of normal human emotions to this kind of otherworldly, the, the monstrous was, I thought you did that brilliantly, that, that, that transition. So I just wanted to ask how you, how you accomplished that. Thank you. Uh, understanding people is my job too, Gabe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. I mean, it is, but uh, yeah, I think, Grounding it in as much in the real as possible, taking a really, um, for lack of a better word, human and empath like empathic or empathetic approach to Tara was my way in. Um, and then kind of adding uh, physical, like physicality for me, as I was saying earlier, is often my um, a way for me to unlock a character. And so adding that in and adding like a, a certain stylistic approach on top of that. Um, I think it was very easy for me to track Tara's journey from start to finish as she becomes more involved with Sam. Mm -hmm. And um, letting that sort of inform a lot of the derangedness of it all. Um, it was fun rewatching it just now uh, at the tail end and seeing like how how as Tara gets closer and closer to the end of the film, she really gets kind of more villainous in a way that I really didn't plan for or expect, but watching it back, it kind of feels that way to me. So a lot of it is, as I said earlier, like trying to track that psychologically and um, internally, and then just trying things out on the day with um, with a great safe container to make it uh, as believable as possible. Well done. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna bring over Michael Laster next, but right before I do, uh, speaking of physicality, I was, 
intrigued by uh, something, Clara, that you said earlier that it was going to be practical. Um, was was the decision to go with digital a um, an early decision or a COVID related one? Totally COVID related. We were prepped, like arduously prepped for practical effects. In fact, thankfully, pre COVID, Dana was fitted for her silicone torso um, rig that actually does split open with like monofilament puppeteers and blood rigging and all of that. So thank God we had that already, her like very real looking stomach. Um, and then once we converted over to, well, then we like launched into the unknown for like, it feels like 50 months, but it was probably only a couple. And then when we came back, we had done all this R and D for, oh my God, there's a tentacle. <laughs> what a souvenir. Yeah, I have this because we needed the texture for the visual effects that it like would like puppeteer and go around. So we did have all of this stuff almost ready to go. Yeah. But yeah, we're right hiding time. it from us. I know. <laughs> it's incredible. I want that's a tentacle. I, <laughs> I feel like that's someone's Halloween costume coming out. It Just one be. tentacle. That's the whole costume. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, but then we were we did all this R and D and like actually hired a really talented animator to to fully convert several sequences to animation. It was going to really change the flavor of the film. And then we were already in principal photography in September for that second half of the shoot when the decision came to to basically punt it over back over to uh, live action in combination with CG, which then we had to like emergency prep as we were shooting. Um, but thankfully, Into the Dark has a really well-oiled and extremely talented and very fast-working visual effects team. Um, and it was definitely not their first rodeo because Into the Dark has done basically every kind of visual effect you can imagine over the course of the tenure of the series. Okay, we have a question from Michael Laster. And Michael, you should be um, able to turn on your mic and camera if you want. Hello. Um, hi guys. Hey, Alex. Hi. Hi. Uh, Alex, thank you for your series, man. It's, I really love it. And um, especially during COVID, it gives me some great outlets to see some new films that are coming out. So My great job. Thank you there. And to the cast, I think you got a, you guys did a great job. I was in it all the way from beginning to end. So wonderful job there with you guys. Um, you. I had a comment and a question. Actually, two questions. Um, I'm really enjoying the Bloomhouse production company. They're, they're putting out some really cool films. So I wanted to find out, I guess, as a director, how, how are you enjoying working with Bloomhouse? And um, at the very end, it seemed like uh, it was kind of an opening for a sequel. So uh, is there going to be a sequel? Um, I, oh. Yeah, I, wouldn't, wouldn't that be an intriguing thing to see? <laughs> That is above my pay grade. But I will say as a director working with Blumhouse was a dream come true, honestly. I mean, how many how many horror production companies can you call essentially a household name? Basically only the, at least to me, only the one really. Unless you're really a really diehard film fan and you know you know the, the past works of the films that led up to this moment in cinema history, chances are you only know Blumhouse if you know any. So, and, and it shows, it shows in their production teams savvy and their wealth of knowledge and their breadth of understanding of just the craft of horror. Um, so it was just very, very cool to work with them. And in terms of a sequel, Michael, just tell all your friends, get our ratings up, get the popularity around it, and then we'll see what we can do. Got it. The power is yours, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> um, just on that note, actually, um, you know, it does, first of all, it, it not only has, um, the, does, does, the, does the, uh, the monster live, but the world, the, like the world expands in that last scene. So, I mean, besides obviously being great, uh, a great setup for a sequel, uh, I am curious to know about the decision for that ending and uh, what made you decide to go that route. Allie? Well, I mean, it was always in the, I think at least it was always in the version, you know, in, in the versions that were in pre-production that, uh, that Tara, this entity meets its 
it's true love. It's true match. Uh, another one of, of it. And, you know, I think it would be, uh, for this, it, it seemed too preposterous that there's, there's only one of this thing out there, you know, there's gotta be another one. Uh, and I, yeah. And that leaves a really nice, uh, question and mystery for the audience of what's going to happen when these two people or not people, these two things, entities, uh, join up. We did flip the gender though, of the yes. strange person at the end uh, and originally scripted the person who's played by Larry Fields, um, was originally female and now, now he male. Um, we have one last question from Raj Bora. So Raj, I'm gonna move you over. Hello. Wow, what a lovely film. I really, Argo and USC and Clara and all your team, you brought the Valentine a little early for me. Other than uh, I did not show her the last scene and all those scenes, but other than that, to uh, characters, uh, Dana and Casey, so it touch me in a, uh, in a love, love also, the true from inner heart, uh, and really the film touch uh, everywhere. And so talented Clara and uh, all your team, definitely. Will be, am I be able to see in the theater also? Sadly, I, as of right now, no theaters, but it will be available on Hulu this Friday, February 12th. Yeah, really, really enjoyed the film and thank you for showing and sharing. And uh, we really, it's a uh, first time, generally I'm not in a inclined to horror movie, but the day I, a few years back, Argo introduced us, uh, Jason and then the, in the film in USC, really enjoyed that film. And I inclined to, her to see this kind of horror movie at the same time. But this movie, not only horror, but at the same time, it does show the other side of it and touching both of the characters and really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Raj. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Raj. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Raj. Uh, well, thank you all so much for, for doing this and joining us for this virtual um, event. Oh, wait, we got one more thing here. Oh, it's a thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, best, best wishes for the release. And um, I, I really hope that people continue out there, continue to discover the many fantastic films uh, that are part of the End of the Dark series. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys do next. Thank you so much. Thank Alex. you so thank much, you. Alex. Thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Appreciate everyone coming in and watching with us. Fight on, guys. Yes, fight on. Mm -hmm.